Hello everyone and welcome back. Today's video is going to be about Lambda throttling and the danger it can pose to your serverless application. Personally, I've seen an entire Lambda based application start failing due to the wide ranging implications that throttling can have. So in this video, I'm going to cover what throttling is and why it happens in AWS Lambda. Followed by that, I'm going to walk you through a practical example. And finally, I'll define some best practices that can help you reduce, if not eliminate, your chances of getting throttled. All right, so firstly, let's talk about what throttling is and why it happens. All right, so what is throttling and why does it happen? So at the highest level, throttling just means that Lambda will intentionally reject one of your requests. And so what we see from the user side is that when making a client call, Lambda will throw a throttling exception, which you need to handle. Uh, typically people handle this by backing off for a period of time and retrying, but there's also some different mechanisms that you can use. Uh, so that's interesting. Lambda will reject your request, but the next logical question is why does this happen or why does it occur? So throttling occurs when your concurrent execution count exceeds your concurrency limit. Now, just as a reminder, if this wasn't clear, Lambda can handle multiple instance invocations at the same time. And the sum of all of those invocations amounts to your concurrency execution count. So assume we're at a particular instant in time. If you have more invocations that are running that exceed your configured limit, all new requests to your Lambda function will get a throttling exception. So this naturally leads to the next question, which is what are the configured limits? So Lambda has a default 1000 concurrency limit that's specified per region within an account, but it does get a little bit more complicated in terms of how this rule applies when you have multiple Lambda functions in the same region and the same account. And we're going to get into that in the next couple of slides. And finally, another interesting note here is that depending on the invocation event source, whether it's manual, SQS, SNS, Kinesis, Dynamo, or something else, they all have different behaviors when encountering throttling exceptions. And we're going to talk about some of those different behaviors in the upcoming slides as well. So now that we know what it is, let's go over a quick practical example covering how this works in a more real life scenario. So here we have our Lambda. And in our Lambda setup, in this particular configuration, I have three functions in my region. So in this region, I have function one, function two, and function three. Now, depending on your circumstance, you may have three separate functions, maybe only one. But in this example, let's assume that these are all completely unrelated functions. They're all doing totally separate things. So function one maybe handles some part of an application. Function two is for a totally separate application. And function three, again, is for something totally separate. The only reason we have them in the same region, the same account, is for convenience purpose. So I think this is a very common setup. Typically, people only have one AWS account. So it's likely that this probably looks something like your setup. Now keep in mind that we have a default 1000 unreserved account concurrency limit. This is the default setting that everyone gets when you set up an AWS account and you're using AWS Lambda. So keep this number in mind because it's going to be relevant in a moment when we actually walk through this. Now say we have a client over here and this client could be some REST API that is acting on behalf of some user through a front end, could be some other setup, but let's just assume it's some API that's calling your Lambda function. Now assume that at a particular instant, a particular moment in time, I start calling this Lambda function, function one, with a very high number of requests. I get a sudden burst of traffic and I'm making hundreds, if not a thousand requests to this particular Lambda function. So let's assume that in response to this burst of requests, at a particular instant of time, I have 1,000 in-flight requests or 1,000 concurrent executions that are running against this function one. So at the very highest level here, if a new invocation comes in at this particular instant in time, that invocation will get throttled because that exceeds our 1000 unreserved account concurrency limit. So if this can never exceed 1000, it can never go to 1001. Any new invocation that exceeds that amount will get throttled and will receive that error. Now this is where it starts to get interesting because there are also implications on function two and function three at this particular moment in time. So we know what happens if you try to invoke on function one at this instant, you'll get throttled. But what happens when you try to invoke on function two? Well, the behavior is, is that function two will also get throttled. 
and it won't get throttled because it is exceeding your concurrency limit. It is getting throttled because function one is exceeding your concurrency limit. So what we're really saying here is that the concurrency limit, the pool of concurrency is shared across all of your Lambda functions that are within the same account and within the same region. So this has some interesting side effects. So if these are completely separate components of an application, like I was alluding to, function one is doing something for one application, function two is for another, function three is for another, that means that a sudden burst of traffic to function one can start result in throttling when new requests come in for function two and function three. And this is the kind of problem with throttling. You can have scenarios where a high burst of traffic to one part of your application can have some cascading effects on other portions of your application. So this is truly the danger of throttling using the default configuration. Uh, so hopefully this example made sense. Now let's move on to how the behavior differentiates depending on the event source that you're using. So handling by event source and invocation type. So SNS to Lambda, I figured I'd start with this. It's one of the more common ones, the common setups that we typically use. And this results in immediate failures. So when SNS will try and invoke your Lambda function, if your throttling limit is hit, it will receive a throttling exception. Now, if you have a retry policy that's configured on your SNS topic, SNS will try to invoke your Lambda function for a period of time, but it can't guarantee that it will eventually succeed. So I believe it actually stops trying after a number of hours. Hours. So keep that in mind if you have this configuration. Uh, so the next one, manual synchronous, uh, is similar behavior from SNS to Lambda. And this is an immediate failure scenario. So kind of how I was showing in that example, if a REST API is trying to hit a Lambda function synchronously to get a response, it will receive a throttling exception. Now, typically how people handle these type of exceptions are in your actual logic, in your code, uh, if you receive a throttling exception, you can back off for a period of time or sleep the thread that's making the call. So, you know, you sleep for 50 milliseconds and then you try again. If you fail again, you back off a little bit more. Maybe you sleep for 100. So you can do some kind of exponential back off here and attempt multiple times before throwing some kind of permanent exception back to your client. And the third one is manual asynchronous, so different behavior actually. And the way this one works is that when an asynchronous invocation is made against your Lambda function, Lambda will put the instance or the metadata about that invocation in an internal queue, and Lambda will pull that queue internally to process that request. Now, if when it pulls the queue and it attempts to process that request, your concurrency limit is hit, it will fail and it'll Put that message back into the queue. Now it will automatically retry for I believe three times. Now if you have a dead letter queue, a DL queue configured on this account, that message can be sent to a dead letter queue where you can kind of pick it up and redrive it at a later point in time. But if you don't have that, this message can be potentially lost forever. And if you don't know what a DL queue is, I have a fantastic video explaining how to set up a dead letter queue with a Lambda function, which I'll put in the description section below and put a pop up to in the top right. Now the fourth one is SQS to Lambda, which is another very common configuration. And this follows the same principles of the asynchronous invocation that I just spoke about. So it'll retry by putting that message back in the queue for I believe up to three or five retries before finally putting it to the DL queue. So same principle applies. You obviously want a dead letter queue here to accommodate for failure so you can redrive them at a later point. And the last one is Kinesis and Dynamo Streams. Now the delivery to Lambda will result in an immediate failure. Same kind of scenario, have a DLQ set up here so that you can capture these failures. Now moving on to how to prevent it. What are the best practices? So we talked about what it is and how it works and why it happens. So how do we prevent this thing from actually happening? Uh, so the first and probably the most easiest thing that you can do is that you can request an unreserved concurrency limit increase, and this is at no cost to you. So the default limit per account per region is 1,000. In my experience, I've got this raised to 5,000 and didn't have to pay anything extra. And the way you do this is by going to the support center in the AWS console and contact support with a technical request, and you can just ask them to increase the limit on your account. And after they do so, you should notice 
the unreserved concurrency limit increase under the configuration section of your Lambda. The second mitigation technique is to specify a reserved concurrency per function. And the way you do this is by going to your Lambda function in the configuration section. And there's a concurrency section where you can see some details about the provision concurrency limits. So what reserved concurrency does, it reserves a number of concurrent execution requests for a particular Lambda function. So in the example that we were discussing before, we had three Lambda functions and they were all kind of competing for that 1000 concurrency limit. Now using this approach, you can slot a 200 concurrent limit for a particular function. So at any point in time, regardless of what your other functions are doing, this function will always be able to handle 200 concurrent requests. And the other two functions, going back to the previous example, will have to compete for this pool. So in this case, it is 800. So keep in mind, this is a mitigation technique. This isn't going to solve your problem, but it's something that you can use to kind of separate your concerns. So each Lambda function has its own reserved pool of concurrency, and you're not going to have competition amongst them. And the next one, uh, perhaps the most important, is to configure a dead letter queue to capture failure. As I've kind of described before, this is very important if you are receiving throttling and you need to redrive those messages at a later point in time. And possibly the most important is to actually alarm on throttling and the presence of messages in your DLQ if you are using one. So obviously setting up a bunch of these mechanisms will help mitigate the issue, but in the case that it does happen, you do need to become aware of it so that you can deal with it appropriately. Keep in mind here that all the mechanisms, all the suggestions that we're making here are in an effort to reduce the likelihood of throttling. I don't think there's a way to completely eliminate it without setting some really, really high high limits. However, you can take some reasonable steps to reduce the likelihood of throttling occurring on your application. So if you like this video, I have a great Lambda playlist, which I'm going to be linking in the description section below. And please don't forget to like and subscribe so that you don't miss out on next week's video. Thanks so much, folks, and I'll see you next time.